My name is Dio Olapade. I am a Bernard Schwartz Fellow at the New America Foundation, and I'm working on a book entitled The Bright Continent. My project is trying to examine non-state networks in Africa and how they can contribute to the project development. Um, so much of modern diplomacy and foreign assistance and even flows of philanthropy tends to deal with states. It tends to try and go to the government to reform it, to hold a vote. So much of the activity that I have observed uh, growing up and during the course of two years of reporting across Africa is that so much of the activity is not with the state. It's in fact with the people. And this can be seen in anything from the fact that nearly 70% of economic activity is in the informal sector. It doesn't even go into GDP statistics. And from the fact that people are leveraging new connective technologies like mobile phones and web access to reach out to global networks that are not necessarily the government. Um, family relationships are very strong. Other types of affiliation, including religion or just commercial transactions, mean more to people than the citizen-state relationship. And so given that fact, I'm trying to probe how we can go where the people are instead of going where the government is, and how you can learn from people who, in resource strange situations in many places in Africa, are learning to do more with less. And this is a very elegant solution to a lot of the problems that we're facing in the 21st century. Um, you know, you could talk about the age of austerity in a lot of Western economies as the way things have been in Africa for some time. And so learning from how people have been resourceful um, with limited resources is a really instructive way to learn. Um, I've divided the book up into a number of different areas that are sectors of development that have been of interest, of course, to institutions like the World Bank or the, the DFID in the United Kingdom, but are also very important to families in Senegal or to schools in Malawi. So I'm looking at education, I'm looking at health, I'm looking at the civil society environment, I'm looking at, um, I'm looking at finance, and I'm also looking at environmental issues. And in each of these five areas, I'm finding that ordinary Africans, private sector, individuals, some NGOs, some religious organizations, are taking the reins of development away from the state and are creating dynamic solutions to these particular problems. Um, some of the things that I've looked at are private schooling in Africa, which is a boom. And of course, it doesn't necessarily mean private school the way you'd think about it in the United States. It's low cost, private schools, mom and pop organizations, maybe they're run by a mosque, maybe they're run by a church, but they're giving parents choice, which is one of those words that always is kind of a bugaboo in the US when you talk about schools. But giving parents choice, they can leave the system where kids drop out, where the teachers don't teach, where tertiary graduation rates are terrible, and where there are no jobs when the kids leave. So I'm looking at the way that ordinary people are intervening in the system of education to better improve their outcomes. Um, in the area of health, I'm looking at the way technology is really expanding people's access to services. Um, people still pay for healthcare, quite a lot. Um, it surprises people to know that those who are poor are still making out-of-pocket expenditures for things like maternal care, for things like general checkups, for things like malaria. Um, but these people are suddenly empowered again, against states that may not be able to get clinics or hospitals or insurance out to the most rem remote areas, you're seeing technology carrying the information that extra mile to allow nurse practitioners or community health workers to provide services to people who wouldn't otherwise get them. Um, and again, the decentralization of all of this is the real key that I'm trying to explain. That the center in Africa, for a number of historical reasons, hasn't always held. Um, and people in response to that, instead of throwing up their hands and looking for handouts or waiting for Bono to show up, are solving the problem themselves in a distributed way. Um, technology is a very important force multiplier, and that's something I know Rockefeller is focused on. Um, so it's very helpful to piece this story together, again, from different sectors of development across, I think, 17 countries I've been to now, um, to build a story of African empowerment, which is very much the reason for calling it the bright continent as opposed to the 1800s uh, image of the continent as a place of darkness. Conversations at Bellagio have been great in that you have people who are coming to things from the environmental perspective, you have others who are talking about insurance, you have others who are talking about aging and how we care for the elderly as communities. Um, that's been helpful to me to sort of 
complement some of the, the area studies that I've been doing. Um, in particular, the conference that was held during my stay on resilience was a wonderful entree into the conversation about how you react to crisis. Of course, the, the, the conference was mostly focusing on environmental impacts and how you respond to the threat of catastrophic climate change. I enter the conversation from, from a political perspective. What do you do when your state has failed you? But the same basic framework for resilience in communities that maybe have been underserved or underestimated really tied together the conversation in a way I thought was really great.